Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. To get involved, go to xyadvisor.com or simply download the XY Advisor app. This podcast series is proudly brought to you by Russell Investments. With more than 80 years of experience, Russell Investments is a global investment solution partner dedicated to helping investors reach their long-term goals. Russell Investments specialize in multi-asset solutions that combine asset allocation, capital markets insights, factor exposure, manager research, and portfolio implementation. Welcome back to the XY Advisor Podcast. I'm Fraser Jack, and we are halfway through our series on uh, ESG investing, or the focus of ESG investing. Uh, And today's episode, we are focusing on the 50 Shades of Green, which is an interesting little topic. So uh, to to kick us off, we've got Philip Moffat. Welcome back. Thanks, Fraser. So uh, tell us about the fifty the fifty shades of green. Obviously, uh, there's um, there's lots of different commentary going on around this. You know, the deep green, the the light green, the the, the middle road. I got a big smile on my face. Green's my favourite colour, so you know I'm happy to indulge in it. Look, let, let me start with an example and try and narrow down. Go from the example out to the concept. Let's say we've got a a mining company that uh, has partaken in poor employment practices and has a high carbon footprint. And we know that we're going to continue mining for that mineral for whatever reason. Is the movement of that company from kind of poor social and environmental output to relatively better an ESG positive investment or not? So that's a light, that's what I'd call light green. Light green is taking relatively poor quality asset, judging from ESG measures, and helping it in its, its transition to become a modestly or, or a positive asset. Dark green is the other extreme. Dark green is you only engage with businesses that already have best practice in place, understand everything they're doing, they measure it, they report it, uh, and they comply with every regulation. The the practical issue from my perspective as a as a asset manager or as an investor is that the pool of very dark green assets is very small and the pool of very light green assets is very big. And so in principle, I would be in favour of going to the big pool and trying to find the ones that we can make darker green and help them along that journey than just only fishing in the dark green pool. But it becomes an issue of personal choice. We discussed in the last episode there, are, there will be some people who, who are ideologically committed to the dark green pool only, and if that's the case, then that's where they should live. And this becomes an interesting conversation then with advisors and their clients, uh, if clients, because it's a bit of an educational process, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you could very easily make the case that I'm going to the light green part of the pool and I'm going to pick some assets that I'm going to try and help improve, but I don't actually help improve them very much. And you're a green washer. Like what, what's a green wash? Is it a dark green asset that's actually light green? Is it a light green asset that doesn't get as dark as you want? So it, it becomes a very – it's it's amorphous. Uh, as much as we would like to say that we've got certain standards and eventually, personally, I think we'll eventually end up with accounting standards for these ESG measures just as we have accounting standards for financial returns. Uh, And so when you read a set of accounts, you can be confident that they've met certain minimum standards. It'll be the same for carbon footprint or for social responsibility and so on and so forth. Um, We're a long way away from that. Uh, And it's an ideological question, really, whether you, you want to take the whole and try and make it better or you only concentrate on what's already good. So where we're at at the moment, as you mentioned, um, the, the benchmarks are a little harder to find. Yeah. Tell us about where we're at in that, in that journey of, of having a, a sound benchmark and, and, and at the moment, who, who, who decides on the labels? Who decides of what's light and what's dark? Oh, well, firstly, like the benchmarking issue, the benchmarking is crude. So it, 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 because... Historically, the way investors who've been concerned about, let's let's use the word ethical, broadly, ethical issues have approached this is they'll say, I've got a certain set of exclusions that I won't touch. I won't invest in gambling or armaments or, or alcohol or whatever it happens to be. So as managers, we're very used to that. Here's a part of the universe, you just chop it off, you can't invest in it. This is much more subtle. This is saying there might be stuff that you don't touch, I get it, but there's other stuff that you might want to touch because you think you can improve it and it's essential and it's not um, necessarily creating a social environmental harm to the extent that you can't live with. Because the standards around that 
are not as clear as just excluding something. It's like, do I include it or not? And if I include it, how do I justify improving it with measurement and so on? Then it becomes an individual assertion around how you measure it, and there's no unifying standards. So that's where the that's where it gets muddy at the moment, Fraser, in the universe, which is that who says something is uh, ESG compliant or, or a good ESG asset or a bad ESG asset or an improving ESG, it's generally the spruker of the asset. So that's either the person who bought it or the person who's trying to sell it. And you've got to think of that partly as advertising. Now, hopefully there's truth in advertising, you know, um, but the truth in advertising standards are relatively minimal at the moment. So, you know, you really got to do due diligence. Yep. And uh, globally, is there any uh, any standards that we can hold our hat to? Yeah, Europe's um, uh, much further ahead uh, in terms of kind of standards that are being applied. Even there, there are not you know, universal standards, um, but there are more um, understood and acceptable standards, and they're developing quite quite quickly, to be honest, um, amongst the providers of kind of benchmarks. Yep. Where does Australia sit in that uh, in that process? Like, uh, how far away are we? Are we sort of just behind Europe? Or? No, no, we're reasonably far behind um, in terms of the formality. There are some organisations that are much further ahead than others. You know, I think about, you know, for instance, um, QBE, the insurance company, has a, a, a program called Premiums for Good. And so if you insured with QBE, you can elect for a portion of your premium to go into a Premiums for Good, and it goes into a portfolio that has minimum standards around ESG and, and green footprint and stuff. So so there are places where you can do that. Most of the super funds, for instance, will have a sustainability option. You know, Aware Super I'm involved with has a sustainable option that you can elect to go into. But in terms of broadly applicable um, um, standards across the board, no. And that does mean that we're all exposed to some element of less than 50% green or, or, or something being in the light green end of the spectrum. And, uh, and so how, how do advisors work through that? I guess they've just got to try and get their roll of their sleeves and, and get their hands yeah, dirty and try I and think find them. Yeah, the, well, they've got to try and find the, the, the assets or the asset manager who provide you with something of the standard that your client expects. So, you know, I would say it's a lot of conversation with your client base about exactly what they, they actually believe and want to invest in. Yep. Philip, thanks for uh, being on this episode. Really appreciate it. We'll uh, catch you in the next episode. Pleasure. Thanks. Thanks, Fraser. Welcome back to this episode, Elizabeth. Uh, thanks for having me, Fraser. It was really good to, to be able to talk to you. <laughs> Fantastic. Now, but today we're talking about the concept of 50 shades of green uh, with regards to ESG investing, and we're looking at uh, all sorts of different things around how do we actually work out uh, a bit of a benchmark? How do we actually work out what or how deep these funds are um, going when they're starting to look at their, you know, deciding um, what, their, uh, what their ratings are? Mm-hmm. What, what are you seeing out there? There's a whole lot of um, ratings agencies out there that uh, rate according to um, proxy voting on issues of um, sustainability. There's um, the Australian Centre for Corporate Responsibility that looks at sort of governance issues. Then there's carbon metrics and whether and to what extent companies are moving away from being um, invested in dirty industries or activities that seem to be injurious to the planet. Um, So there's a whole lot of different um, factors that are involved. Um, And I find that with clients, um, they often don't know what it is that they're particularly interested in until you um, ask them the question and give them some ideas about the sorts of things that they could think about. Yep. Now, in one of the previous episodes, you mentioned the idea of the leaf rating. Yep. Do you want to talk to me about how that works? Yeah, so the leaf ratings um, are put together by a series of um, advisors from the Ethical um, Advisors Cooperative and um, a number of funds and um, investments are rated depending on what it is that the advisor thinks that their average client would think about things. For example, um, some funds say that they've got uh, a certain percentage of... um, Capital that's uh, can that that's left over from their main um, asset base that can be allocated to uh, things that are not necessarily deep green like um, coal, for 
for example. Um, but some funds that say that they're ethical say that 20% of this type of fund can go to something that um, is uh, a fossil fuel type um, activity. And some funds say that only 5% of their assets can go to that type of activity. Um, so often these are because um, funds can be invested in some of the um, really, really big um, companies that are gradually moving away from their exposure to fossil fuels. Um, but 20% is probably more than the average client would be comfortable with whereas 5% might be something that they think that they have to put up with for a while as long as they have some conviction that the fund manager and or the company is moving out of that type of investment. Yeah, well, who gets to decide what they, those percentages are? That... Um, the percentages, I think that um, the percentages of decisions made by fund managers and also by companies, and so that's where sort of shareholder activism and pressure from investors comes in. And if there's enough um, impetus behind what it is that investors are thinking, then a company will need to move, yep. as in the case of Royal Dutch Shell recently. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Okay, great. And where, um, where there's, there's sufficient noise from influential investors or uh, loud investors, or possibly both, um, to make a company change. Yeah, yep. and uh, I guess there's a little bit of social media that goes along with those sorts of uh, activism. Um, possibly, I'm, yep. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I'm, the, the, not, I'm uh, not really in, in the social media space. Or yep. just media in general. You know, uh, I think the media tends to pick up on these things if uh, if, it, if you know, and if a company is to blame for for doing something wrong. Possibly, but I think that um, the way that this actually works is that there's a lot of movement behind the scenes and a lot of talking to companies about what they're doing. Um, people are actually wanting some transparency about what a company's undertakings are and how they actually measure up against those undertakings. Um, and I think that there's a lot of noise and marks on pieces of paper, but not necessarily that companies are moving on any of this stuff. Um, and there's a recent um, PricewaterhouseCoopers review that said that Australian companies are all signed up to all of these changes and making themselves more transparable and accountable, but there's very little action right. in Australia. Yep. Right, fair enough. And that was about last year, 2021. Oh, yep. 2020, yep. Okay, and so uh, so, the, so really the only way to go is to is to look for look for those uh, as you said the ethical advisors co op or um, what was the other one the A um, RIAA Responsible Investment Association of Australia and they're um, pretty big they sort of set what's regarded as a a benchmark in terms of what companies and funds are doing I know what what funds and in, and super funds are doing well. And they're uh, regarded as the um, the leaders in terms of setting these sorts of benchmarks. And that's um, the gold standard pretty much for what's happening in Australia and New Zealand. Okay, fantastic. And so uh, it's, it's obviously the deeper you go, and it, well, I, well, I feel like the deeper you go, you're always going to find something that's not quite perfect in, in, in a business or a company that you can um, sort of so – is there any really, really deep, deep green companies around, I guess, or funds? <laughs> Um, there are some deeply green funds and they're doing spectacularly well in terms of their financial returns. They're just, um, I'm told this is the wrong expression, but they really are shooting the lights out um, okay. in terms of their returns. And those companies are transparent and also quite particular about which uh, companies they will invest in. Um, yep. And um, there's one fund that I know that a little while ago decided to divest itself of Facebook um, after the Cambridge Analytica scandal. And there was quite a lot of kerfuffle in the local press about that, saying who do they think they are. However, their company policy said that um, they – look at people's privacy and human rights as a key issue when they decide which companies are going to be in their fund. Yep. And um, and they, they, they have done and they're continuing to do spectacularly well in terms of their financial returns. Yep, fantastic. 
Well, thank you so much, Elizabeth, for, for uh, chatting to us in this episode. We look forward to catching up with you, with you again in the next episode when we really start to dive deep into what is the difference, what are the, all the different things in the, the E, S, and G, or G, I should say, uh, in the next episode. Okay. Welcome back, Paul Gunner. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you for being here. Now, in this episode, we're talking about Fifty Shades of Green and uh, specifically the idea of you know who gets to uh, who gets to decide these benchmarks, and you sort of mentioned the uh, the work you're doing with the co-op uh, and the leaf rating. So we might go into a little bit of that, uh, but let's start with the um, you know the the idea that often fund managers just have a view, um, and then uh, and then they promote that view as as you know as, as their fund and, and those things. So talk to us about um, the Fifty Shades of Green. Sure, that's that whole concept of uh, light green, dark green. Uh, it is uh, again, it's very subjective, and fund managers will make their choices about the balance between uh, what they're trying to achieve on an ESG level versus what they're trying to achieve on a investment return level. So they'll do that by saying, "Well, we'll invest in companies. We'll filter out these companies as long as." Five or ten percent of the revenue isn't derived from this particular area. For, for instance, mining or or um, or fossil fuels, transport of fossil fuels, those sorts of things. That's the sort of compromises that a fund manager will make to achieve their desired investment returns. So it's important as advisors to be aware of that, and I guess not to make judgments, but but to tell them that, okay, well, there will be a certain sector of our clients who, do, who have no tolerance towards that area. And therefore, this fund for, for those people won't be appropriate. And, and we give them that feedback. And so we say that, okay, well, you, you make your choices, but th- this is the feedback from people uh, with an average or, or, or deep green people won't like that. Uh, lighter green people, you know that that compromise is fine, uh, and <laughs> it must be a tough job for the fund managers because uh, they've got to make a decision about exactly who they're going to target, and and it's up to us to interpret that and then be that matchmaker between the individual and their values and and that fund and whether that will mix. Yep. Some of the comments I've heard from the fund managers around this, um, you know, the deep green versus the the medium green, and you mentioned this in the last episode, the the influence that money has on businesses, uh, and, uh, the, the influence of investor money on on businesses, um, and there's sort of there's a couple of different schools of this. One is you take the money away from them and say if you want the money back, you have to do X Y Z, uh, and the other, you know, the other comments from a lot of um, fund managers that are. Well, we can actually provide influence if we have a seat at the table, um, and we're actually still invested. But we say, we say actively as a as a as an investor that we want to move towards this space. Um, so there's sort of a couple of schools of thought there. There's sort of no right or wrong, I guess, when it comes to as you mentioned judgments. That's right, and but you you can see whether you know if they are trying to influence, you can see that in the way uh, that that they're walking the talk uh, that their voting behaviour in, in shareholder meetings. You can, uh, you know, are they voting according to what they're saying they're, they're trying to influence? Yep. Uh, so that's one way we try to hold them to account in, in that area. Yep. And we've seen a few Australian companies obviously in this space go, well, you know what, we'll divest and, and create different spin-off arms mm-hmm. and, you know, Put our put our dirty coal or something over there, or put our alcohol over there, and um, yep. uh, create a separate business for that. Yep, uh, yeah, Woolworths a great example of that. I, I think more so on the gambling side because they're a huge, huge part of the gambling industry. Through, yeah, through, yeah, and it's it's interesting though. It's just because I always sort of think, well, just because you've divested a, a business, it's there's it hasn't cut it out, it hasn't stopped it. Yeah, yeah. So it, it you know, that I guess there's. Uh, a cynical way of looking at it, and, a, and another, and another way, <laughs> as yeah. with anything. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's um, a fair. Um, you, you you can see it start starting to drive behaviour, which is kind of good. You know, if you want to yeah. avoid that, then it, it's make it it's made it easier 
for the fund managers to make those choices and for us yep. uh, exactly. as well. Yes, and it's not exactly a small ship to turn. So yeah. um, talk, talk to us about the LEAF rating system. You sort of mentioned that in one of the previous episodes um, with the with the Ethical Advisors Co-op. And obviously, you know, this is this has had some sort of effect on um, the funds. That, well, that's right. Uh, we essentially, uh, the, the process is we examine, uh, we decide, okay, or we approach by or, or we decide this, this fund has got ESG or, or something of that nature in its title. Let's, have, let's analyse it. Let's see what's in it, what's not in it, um, what their investment philosophy is, what their voting history is, uh, who's behind it, what's their track record, or all of those sorts of issues we try to distill into uh, a summary that up to 20, uh, 20 of us vote on. So uh, our criteria is how would the average ethical investor rate this or, or view this investment? Uh, so five ratings would be ideal uh, down to one, which is forget it. Um, uh, it's especially greenwashing um, and, and in between. So uh, we all vote on that and, and, and then average it out and, and that's what the rating is. We then feed that back to the fund manager for their comments and or uh, just to note if there's any inaccuracies or, or new developments that we're not aware of and often and then we'll we'll screen that, and then maybe in a year's time or so, the fund manager will ask for a re-rating because they they either taken on the feedback, and they've adjusted their processes, and and they like us to take another look at it. So it's it's a way of uh, holding the industry to account, and also to make sure that we're giving them a fair go. Yep, fantastic, and uh, and so that green that leaf rating, if you like, that's designed for consumers to be able to, to understand. Yeah, yes, it's it's uh, it's very plain language. It, uh, it, it depending on the uh, appetite of the individual to know what's behind that, uh, it it has as much information in there for them to make a decision on how uh, how green they want they want their investment to be. Yep. Fantastic. Paul, thank you for coming on and sharing that. Uh, I encourage everyone to jump on the uh, the Ethical Advisors Co-op and, and check out the, uh, the the LEAF rating system. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Welcome back to this episode, Alexandra. Thank you so much, Fraser. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, we're talking about the, the 50 Shades of Green. There's probably not 50, let's face it. We're just using that top, that title. Uh, but But talk to us about the different shades of green. Sure. So I think, you know, when you're, when you're looking at, at a, at a fund, uh, the different shades of green, like the first, the first temperature test that I do when I'm looking at a fund is I look at their holdings and I, I just even look at just the top 10. And if I'm seeing things like fossil fuel or mining companies, if I'm seeing the big banks, the big tech, giants, uh, carbon intensive industries, controversial industries, it's a fair indication that this fund is probably out of the ethical realm and certainly not in that deep green, uh, deep green realm. Uh, the next thing I would do is look at their responsible investing policy. So does it provide detailed information on their screening process? Does it explicitly state what thresholds they have for inclusions and exclusions. Uh, for, you know, for an example, if a fund excludes tobacco, do they have a 0% threshold, which will probably more on that deep green scale, or do they have a 10% threshold, meaning that they can still potentially have supermarkets uh, that are selling tobacco in their portfolios, and that might be on the lighter green scale. Yeah, so I think they're probably the two, but from there, I would probably go onto their voting records. Uh, so first, do they have them publicly available? Uh, more importantly, are they in aggregate or, uh, you know, in other words, all of their funds are in the one voting record or can I see the voting specifically for each and every fund? Because at the end of the day, if, uh, you know, the fund is voting uh, against increased climate dis disclosure, it's probably not going to be in that deep green uh, shade. Alternatively, if they are uh, voting against, you know, resolutions around human rights and, and those kinds of things, then again, not so deep green. 
And I would probably also look at engagement. And so whether the fund has a detailed engagement policy, whether they disclose areas of engagement that they focus on, do they detail the outcomes of engagement? I think that's a really big one to show to, to demonstrate deep green. But this one's a little bit tricky because sometimes with engagement, it can happen uh, with a fund and a company over a number of years before you actually see any tangible outcome. So, uh, you know, it's it's not it's not a black and white uh, response there for me, but for me, engagement practices are really fast becoming the deciding factor for whether a fund is deep green, whether they're just talking the talk or whether they're actually walking the walk, because it gives you a sense of the culture uh, of the fund manager and whether they take their stewardship role seriously. That is very deep. That's amazing. Um, now, obviously, you spend a lot of time doing research uh, and whilst it rolls off the tongue uh, for you, it, it when I listen to you speak, I think, gee, because that sounds like it's a big role for a financial advisor to, to get their head around talking to those individual funds and going deep into the voting rights and the, and the, and the engagement. Uh, how do you, how do you think, and you know, the, the financial advisor who's got lots of SOAs to write and other things to do in their office spends the time or gets that information? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I mean, there are there are certainly advisors out there that are doing that, that are in this space. But you know, there's also outsourcing yep. to people like me, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who love doing this thing and can give you the the uh, shortened, abridged version. Is this what uh, Altiorum does? No, they take uh, they take research that's around ESG, sustainable investing, and and uh, summarize it. Whereas I. I do fund research as a service, so I, yeah. Oh, nice. Okay, very good. Yeah, in my very consulting. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also uh, with the co-op, how does the co-op work in that space, with the space? So with the co-op, because of all the greenwashing that was out there and the difficulty and, and I guess the opaqueness of investments and the time that it takes to to go through all of this, we developed the leaf ratings system. So if you go to the co-ops website and just and have a look at the leaf ratings, we've what we've done is we've taken super funds and investment funds and conducted some research on that. So we look at, you know, things like the holdings and engagement and, and that kind of thing. We look at all those areas. And then the co-op votes on the funds uh, from the perspective of their average ethical client. So how would their average ethical client consider the fund to be ethical and uh, you know full disclosure I am on that leaf ratings working group um, which means I do get to assist with analyzing the funds and producing the research sheets which are available on on the leaf ratings website which is a great you know helpful step I have to say though that I don't vote on the leaf ratings because I'm not an advisor so only advisor members get to vote but um, for you listening, if you wanted to check out, you know, uh, the highly rated funds and see what good looks like, go to Leaf Ratings, click on those ones with four and a half st- uh, leaves or, or four leaves and use that as a benchmark and compare that with the low scoring funds. Yeah, inter- very interesting. Now, um, I, I want to lean into this concept that um, just because something is not deep green doesn't make it bad. Yeah. What are your, yeah. What are your thoughts? <laughs> So are you suggesting that, you know, that there's lots of different shades of green? <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, there is, there's definitely shades of green and, and it's, yeah, it's not all good and it's not all, all bad. And this, it relates to both companies and funds. So there's not, there's none that's a hundred percent ethical. If you look deep enough, you are always going to find something, you know, as, as an example, Let's look at Cochlear. It's a it's an Australian company that produces hearing implants and devices. It usually ends up in Australian focused ethical investment funds, be, um, because of the, the positive impact that these implants have on people's lives. But on the other hand, the cost of these hearing implants is quite high, and uh, uh, inaccessible for for many people. So, is this inaccessibility? That's a negative, you know, it's this, this positive and negative side by side. Uh, another example would be in a fund, they might hold the big four banks, you know, the big four banks. And on one hand, we need banks to finance mortgages and business loans and infrastructure that positively affects people and society. 
But on the other hand, the banks are also financing fossil fuel companies and deforestation and biodiversity loss and plastic pollution. And, you know, so if, if a fund holds these banks, is this fund necessarily, you know, deep green or, or not green or good or bad or whatever? You know, I think another question to ask, though, is that fund engaging with with companies? Uh, you know, are they pushing the banks to reconsider their investment in fossil fuels? And then, of course, that opens the question of, is it better to hold the fund because of the engagement or is it better to divest? So a whole nother can of worms, which we won't go into, Fraser. Yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty much where I was going with that around the fund manager's attitude and, and whether they do actually influence uh, for positive or whether they're happy to just sort of sit back and... Um, uh, and and say oh that's fine as long as they keep uh, providing returns for the for the um, for the member fantastic uh, and we'll probably uh, get to a little bit more on that supply and demand conversation but uh, I think you answered the question I was going to ask you who decides um, with the, with regards to the benchmarking but you sort of mentioned that uh, with the, the leaf rating it's just the advisors who are in the co op that decide that based on what they believe their clients would expect. Yeah, and I think that, that including the client in this response is the most important thing. So if you were to ask me, you know, who decides what's ethical for a financial advisor, my answer is actually your client. <laughs> um, you know, ideally that you would have a questionnaire, you would uncover, you know, what, what to ethical preferences your client has, what ESG matters, uh, issues matter most to them, and and even better if, you know, the questions coincide with ethical screens on the funds. But, you know, for me, uh, uh, what I generally say is that um, the Responsible Investment Association have a framework. Uh, it's called the RIA Spectrum, and it outlines all the different responsible investing techniques used in ethical investment products. So from ESG integration to positive and negative screening, norms-based screening, engagement, impact investing. So for me, when looking at what is ethical, uh, I use this is the ideal framework that I would use um, and then how an investment product fits in with this framework. It's got, it's even got the ABCs, which I, I just think is, I only realised this probably a few months ago actually at the rear conference that, uh, that it refers to the ABC. So in other words, how a, a product a, avoids harm, B, benefits stakeholders, and C, contributes to solutions. So the AVCs, so it's super easy. So I take this framework, this RIA spectrum, it defines what an ethical investment product is or what techniques could be used in an ethical investment product. I would then overlay your client's values on top of that, and it's that combination of what's possible plus your client's values that determines what's ethical. And it's going to be, and what is ethical is then unique for every every one of your clients. Yeah, fantastic. Well said. I, lo- I love that uh, who decides conversation. Uh, that It probably takes us a little bit into the next episode where we start talking about how do we talk to our clients and, and prioritise things. I love the fact that you've uh, referenced that spectrum and the ABCs and, and people can find it uh, at the RIA website. Really appreciate for uh, joining us in this episode. I look forward to chatting you in the next episode. Thanks so much, Fraser. James, thanks for coming back to this episode where we're talking all things around the 50 shades of green. Hi, Fraser. Thank you for coming back. Now, uh, look, uh, let's, let's just let's get into the concept of the 50 shades of green because because we sort of mentioned, or I know you've mentioned it in previous episodes um, in this space. H- how do we decipher this confusing net of, you know, where do we start, where do we stop, um, where do we sit and how do we compare? Yeah, look. I might talk a little about exclusions because um, that's something that we see a lot of in in, in ESG investing, and uh, um, you know, so where do you stop? And and the, the, probably a great example was um, uh, Engine Number One uh, in the US took a position in Exxon Mobil, not because they thought Exxon Mobil was a um, an amazing company, but they wanted to influence the behaviour um, of that company to, to to transition away from its fossil fuels business. So. Uh, they've got seats on the board now to to really change how that company is um, is operating. And the reason I mention that is, um, you know, if you exclude um, companies like Exxon from your investment criteria, then uh, you don't have that ability to influence. Um, so, what um, in in terms of like the Russell House view, on the whole, um, you know, we think that that having positions in securities. 
uh, allows us to to engage through through our voting, through our lobby lobby groups, um, etc. Um, we do use exclusions as well. So you know we we have a, a tobacco exclusion across all of our uh, Russell funds. We also exclude um, nuclear weapons uh, as a standard as well. But you know in, in areas that that are important like you know climate change. Um, uh, and you know, oil and gas companies. Um, a lot of those companies will be the solution. You know, we we do need power and energy to um, for our economies to operate. So having um, those holdings in companies um, is often better than simply excluding um, to 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 have greater influence. So I think that's that's probably a good place to start. So this adds a new dimension, doesn't it? Over time, to the you know the Fifty Shades. Maybe there's more than fifty. Um, but we're looking at the concept of saying, well, is it now? Is it in the future? And how far down the future? And and, and what's the trajectory mm. it's on? Not just where they are now and where they've been. Yeah, look, and, and there's also, um, you know, client requirements and, um, you know, they're like, so, you know, we, we have a number of universities as, as clients and um, that their student body are quite influential in terms of how, how their investments get um, determined. And, uh, as a result, we you know we we have launched a separate fund that that has harder exclusions around fossil fuels, um, you know. But that you know that doesn't allow us to have um, uh, for, for that particular fund. You know we, we can't really engage with the company now. Obviously, um, Russell has many different funds. You know we've got over four hundred billion um, globally, so um, we still have um, it, you know investments in a lot of these companies and 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 you know. It is the best way to to influence behaviour, but you know we we do recognise that um, uh, that approach isn't dark green enough for for some clients. They want a kind of harder, darker green type of product, and you know where we can you know we, we can get sufficient assets to to launch a product that then, then we will certainly do that. And uh, you know we recognise that I think that's the challenge with with ESG investing. You know people sit diff, you know diff, at different places along that green spectrum. Um, a lot of our products are kind of medium shade of green um, to, to try and cater for um, the bulk of investors, if you like. Um, but we do offer, you know, those harder, darker green products um, for, for particular client segments that, that, that want harder types of, of exclusions. When you mentioned the spectrum, I'm imagining the bell curve in this particular scenario where a lot of people are sitting in that middle and then you, you have the, uh, the extremes at each end. Yeah, no, I think that's right. Um, you know, we, I probably would say that the the light green is something we we don't really like to to play in. You know, I think we we do see products, uh, you know, that are quite light green, and and I think that that really starts to to run into that greenwashing type of of area. So you know, you'd, we really want to be in you know the medium shade of green where we we have some clear um, ESG um, characteristics of of our ESG funds. Be very clear on you know what they are in terms of you know product labeling and, and disclosures. Um, just trying to avoid that that light green because as I say that that's really you know where you are kind of falling into the more greenwash type of of product. Yep, uh, it's good. It's a good analogy. Now the um, the the concept of you know you mentioned inclusions or sorry exclusions, and I'm thinking obviously that is inclusions. Obviously, like we don't want this uh, the away from type uh, exclusion. Um, or we do want this. How much does that play a factor, or is it a bit of both that you really need to? to, to we don't want this, but we also want a bit of that. Like, is it a push or pull type um, Look, decision yeah, making process? Good question. Yeah, really good question. And, and um, you know, something that we've actually seen probably more recently is is the focus on the positive side. So you know, obviously exclusions are, are the negative for you know they're the negative screens. Um, but how are you reinvesting that money you know, from a positive perspective? So um, on the whole, we are we are using kind of aggregate ESG scores, so um, uh, you know, how well a company scores on overall ESG credentials. Um, you start to get into areas of, of other focus areas, so um, clients might want. Well, I think I mentioned in a previous session, exposure to you know batteries or you know lithium, um, education or health. You know that. that these are the, the kind of typical positive tilts that, that you might see um, in ESG products as well. Um, but yeah, on the whole, um, most of the Russell products are using uh, what I call aggregate ESG scores so that we can you know, make sure that the fund is, has an overall um, better ESG 
characteristic than 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 its than its investment universe. Yep. And with that ESG scores, or the aggregate ESG scores, is it is there some sort of mm. benchmark that you use, or is it just something that you you you've come up with? And, and how how do advisors, I guess, compare that to across the market? Yeah, look, I think it's actually quite a confusing area. I, I did a piece on this um, uh, a couple of months ago because, um, you know, certainly one, uh, there's, there's been quite a lot of um, academic studies on this that, that shows that different ES, no, ESG scores vary quite a lot between providers. So um, what we do, um, we use our own um, proprietary metrics. Um, we're using something called the SASB or the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. So, so they um, have a, a materiality map. So it, just focusing on the financial materiality of, of ESG by sector. So, you know, um, what's important to a bank on how well that scores from an ESG perspective is going to be different to, you know, what, what's important for some, someone like a BHP. Um, but, but, but this this SASB map is um, uh, it, you know, it, it, it's a it's a good independent source to to determine what characteristics we should be focusing on, and it really really becomes quite concentrated. So uh, some of the old ESG scoring has been you know the, too generic. Um, what we're focusing on is, is financial materiality, and and that 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 should lead through to investment performance. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, so that uh, I'll have to check out the SASB map, but that sounds like it's got a uh, fairly decent um, accounting standard behind it that you can sort of benchmark yeah. off. And it, it's it's definitely freely available to download off their website. So yeah, yeah, yeah fantastic, James. Thanks for coming on this episode, the Fifty Shades of Green, and clearing up a little bit of stuff for us. Uh, in the next episode, we're going to dive deeper into what's uh, what's behind all the ESNG and how to how do we prioritize those in client conversations. I look forward to chatting you in that episode. Thanks, Fraser. 